and the necessity of black power. I want to greet you all in a manner that I think Mama Nazebo almost prefaced for me when she was doing her beautiful libation. In the vision and spirit of three of our greatest African leaders in the Western world. In the vision and spirit of Toussaint La Overture, Book Mandata, and Jean Jacques Dessalines, who back many years ago on the 22nd of August, 1791, had the audacity, the temerity, and according to those who wanted to oppress us, the unmitigated gods believed that their lives were not meant for enslavement, that they were not beasts of burden. And their subsequent victory over the so-called greatest military mind of the day, Napoleon Bonaparte, we kicked his derriere, we could say that, right? That's French, but you know, we, we multilingual here, right? Created the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere, Haiti, and taught African people that through armed resistance, we too can have our own nation state and be a free, proud, and productive people. So we want to give thanks to them who create, because their victory created the ideology and movement that we now know and call Pan-Africanism, I'll say. Also, when we talk about Pan-Africanism, we have to give honor to those who came before us, as Mama Nabizibo stated, in the great line of divine that started with Henry Sylvester Williams and Queen Mother Moore and Yah Santawa, Marcus Garvey and Anna, Le Anna Julia, Julia Cooper, to name a few. And I also want to, before I really get into the meat of my presentation, invoke the wisdom of some of the ancestors. And that ancestor is Fannie Lou Hamer. We all know Fannie Lou Hamer was putting her work down in Mississippi, the Magnolia State, when she was fighting against the Dixiecrats and created the Mississippi Democ Freedom Democratic Party. And she taught us to never forget where you come from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. And there's an African proverb that states that the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. But I believe that I'm a product and an example that the strength of a nation begins in the homes of its people as well. And I would like for my parents to stand, they are here today, John and Rebecca Hope. They've been married 44 years. <laughs> That's right. They raised three beautiful children and I'm their favorite. <laughs> but I say that to say that all that I am and all that I will be is because of those two individuals right there. Respect, I'll say. All right. So before I get into my soliloquy on Kwanzaa, the Nguzo Saba, and the necessity of black power, back in the 60s, they used to talk about agents who was working for COINTEL Pro. But I believe today in 2021, we have agents of confusion sowing discord in our community. So I want to read a brief poem by one of our greatest master teachers who transitioned many years ago, Dr. Aza G. Hillier III. And it's entitled, After the West Was Won. It starts, they really learned to love the Indian, even had an Indian head on half a nickel. They really learned to love the Indian Streets like Apache Lane and Navajo Trail were called their former glory. They really learned to love the Indian. Tapestries that look like Indian baskets decorate the walls of fancy hotels. They really loved to learn to, they really loved to learn the Indian. Creole shops and airports give everyone a chance to own Indian trinkets. They really learned to love the Indian some people claim to be 164th Cherokee because of a great, great, great grandmother. They really learned to love the Indian that used to be God. I hope they never learn to love the African. Dr. Aza G. Hilliard. I think that poem was powerful because it teaches us we should never seek the love, adoration, or acceptance of any people other than our own. For as Marcus Garvey taught us, that even under the most severe conditions, we should never hate or dislike ourselves. I say, we should never hate or dislike ourselves, even under the most severe conditions. So the question is, what is Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa is a non-heroic, non-religious holiday 
that celebrates the best of what it means to be African and human in the fullest sense. There are five key components of Kwanzaa, the end gathering of the people. We are gathered here today to celebrate, first and foremost, ourselves and our unique way of being human in the world. Second, we give reverence for the creator of creation. This is why we respect all living things. We commemorate the past. For as African Proverbs states, if you know your beginning well, the end will not trouble you. Sankofa. We recommit ourselves to our highest cultural idea. Nuguza Saba should be the minimum set of values. The highest will be Mat. And we celebrate the good in life. So the question comes, how does Kwanzaa connect with black power? Well, Kwanzaa is a child of the 60s, birthed in the reaffirmation of our Africanness, in which we would not suffer the indignities of Jim Crow, of segregation. This fight, this resistance, this advocacy for black power started during the Middle Passage. It started during the Barracoons, and we have been fighting ever since. But the most important aspect of gaining power isn't simply the fight, it's the gain and maintain. So that we're not simply fighting against something, we have something to fight for. Ashe. Dr. Amos Wilson and his seminal text, Blueprint for Black Power, which that is my Bible, by the way, and it should be everyone's Bible if you're serious about black empowerment, says that power is germane to all living things. The great orator, Frederick Douglass stated that power conceives nothing without a demand. But what can a people demand when it looks like they've lost their testicular fortitude? In which we allow the powers that be to conflate issues of anti-black racism with other identity groups. We don't have to get into the nitty gritty there, but you know where I'm going there, right? Where we allow Quixotic and antiquated ideas such as having a seat at the table to mean real progress. But I'm here to tell you that having a seat at the table simply means you are a black diner at a white establishment eating white food. I'm going to say that one more time. Having a seat at the table means you are a black diner at a white establishment eating white food. So what is that white food? White supremacy? paternalistic white liberalism, performative allyship, and symbolic, not substantial, political victories. You say, what do I mean? We all celebrated 13 years ago the, the historic and successful campaign by Barack Obama to become the first black president. We hooped and hollered and we came out and voted in numbers they never saw before. And then we, what did we get for it? He ignored us. A year and a half ago, we saw Kamala Harris, HBCU alum, do what? Run for vice president. She won, we celebrated, and she ignored us. Power is not symbolic. Power is substantial. So what's the solution? We have to end our dalliance with this two-party system. We have to go back to doing what? Grassroots community organizing, where we run our own candidates, we fund our own campaign, like Stoke Stokely Carmichael did in Lowndes County, Alabama. Ashe, like the Black Panthers did in Oakland. Ashe, like the US organization did in LA. Ashe. This isn't stop. This isn't just anti antiquated talk from the 60s. Chokwe Lumumba did it in Jackson, Mississippi in 2014. Unapologetic pan Africanist, he became the mayor of a majority black city. This isn't rhetoric, it's reality. Black power is the solution. And I'm going to close, I'm going to be very brief. But to do this, we have to focus on three things. As I said it before, we have agents of confusion not only in our community, but outside of our community. And part of it is because they lack the ideological, ideological frame of reference to understand how to solve black issues. Our issues are not multicultural issues. Our issues are not people of color issues. Our issues are not 
urban issues or minority issues, as they like to say in the media. Sometimes you got to make it plain. I'll say, to gain power and maintain power, we must restore the African family unit. You can't have a community without having a strong family base. Number two, we must return to controlling the institutions in our communities, politically and economically. And last but not least, we must return to the tradition of educating our own children formally or informally. If we send them to the public school, they better have a Saturday school, Juma Mosi. When you go to other communities, the Jewish community, the Chinese community, the Italian community. When you go to the synagogue, that's no religious instruction, that's cultural instruction. They have high standards, and I have high standards for mine. I teach my children when the grades come in, because that's who and what we are. We are the fathers and mothers of humanity and human civilization. So there's no need for us to act like we don't run the world. If you didn't know, you better know, I say. So I'm gonna close by stating, the Kwanzaa is not simply a cultural celebration. I believe it is a cultural and ideological call to arms. So we'll store ourselves to our traditional greatness by focusing in the way that we can to, to do what? Gain and maintain black power. Thank you.